God bless you, everyone. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And uh, I have a word from the Holy Spirit to share with you and something special that we're going to do at the end of this service. Daniel chapter 9, uh, while you find your way there, just want to remind you, um, if you loved Marty's music, uh, they have a table out in the foyer. Jennifer, his wife, is going to be there, and uh, you can get some of the CDs. Uh, when we leave, most of you are going to leave out of the French doors, so you can just go out the French doors, down the sidewalk, go right back in the front doors, and stop by the table and just see uh, Marty and see Jennifer, and uh, take some of uh, Friday night, so much beautiful music. Last night, every service, um, he shared some different things with us, and all of it has just been so beautiful. And uh, do you notice how it just brings the presence of the Lord? It just, it, it just brings his presence right into the room. So take that home, bring his presence into your car, into your workplace, into your home. Daniel 9, let's begin reading in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Israel would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, with sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our princes and to our fathers and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. Don't have time to read all the words of this beautiful prayer. One of the most beautiful prayers of intercession in the entire scripture. But jump down to verse 16. Look at the end of verse 16 with me. And let's listen to just the concluding words of this prayer. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now our God, verse 17, hear the prayers and the petitions of your servant. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Come on, would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, come. Yeshua, Jesus, be our peace and break down the dividing wall. God, I pray you do something miraculous here in the spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Every week while I'm preparing for our weekend worship services, I study and I pray and I listen and I wait for what I call the download. Inevitably, there comes a moment each week when all of a sudden it just clicks in my spirit, in my mind, in my heart, and I know what is the direction of the Lord for the coming weekend. Sometimes I get the download when I first wake up in the morning after I've been studying late into the night. Sometimes I get it on my way to bed. It's rather inconvenient because it keeps me up another hour or two sometimes when it comes. When I get the download, usually I can't write fast enough to capture everything that the Holy Spirit just sends flooding into my heart and into my mind. This week I received the download on Tuesday evening while we were sitting here under the ministry of our friend Todd McDowell. We've just started a study on the book of 1 Corinthians, and I'm eager to get to chapter 2. I've already gotten the download from chapter 2. That'll be for next week. But on Tuesday evening, the Holy Spirit just redirected me. And I want to share a few quick thoughts with you, and then there are two special acts that we're going to do together. One is an act of identification or repentance, and one is an act, a prophetic act of blessing that we're going to do. And I believe, listen, already uh, Friday, last evening, or 8.30 this morning, it's just been so powerful, and I know God has more for us. So I want to share with you some quick thoughts from the prayer life of Daniel. First of all, when the sands of time shift, search the word to see what God has to say about it. Daniel had the most amazing political career in the entire Bible. He was taken as a teenager, a prisoner of war from Jerusalem, and taken to Babylon where he rose to be the top advisor to King Nebuchadnezzar II. 
And he held that position of top advisor for more than 80 years. He served under four different despotic dictators and two fearsome world empires. But when Daniel saw a historic shift, when he saw that power was shifting on the world stage, he began to search the word of God to see what God had to say about it. In the first year of Darius' reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures that the desolation of Jerusalem would be over after 70 years. Beloved, I want to tell you that now is a very good time for Christians to search the scriptures. Now is a very good time for us to immerse ourselves in the word of God. Now is a very good time for us to know what the Bible says, to know what we believe. Get into our discipleship classes. Get into, uh, take, take advantage of the ministries that we have to offer. Now is a very good time for us to memorize the scriptures because the sands of time are shifting. Power on the world stage is shifting. I hate to be glum, but it is shifting away from the United States and the Western world, and that has implications for our future and for our children's future. Historic shifts among the nations are occurring right now that are fulfillments of biblical prophecy. As I sat here on Tuesday evening in the beautiful atmosphere of the Holy Spirit, there was Dom Crincoli and our worship team just did an amazing, beautiful job all week. And as I sat there in that atmosphere, the Lord just dropped four signs of the times in my heart. I know there are many signs of the times. There are many biblical prophecies. Pastor Nick spent a whole year on Wednesdays teaching out of the book of Revelation. That's all up on our YouTube channel. It's all up on our website. But there were four signs that the Lord gave me. And I don't have time to elaborate this morning. I did in the other services. There's not time today, but I'll just tell you what they are. The first two signs are the rapid rise of anti-Semitism and the rapid rise of Christian persecution. Beloved, I want to tell you it is on like Donkey Kong right now. And anti-Semitism and Christian persecution are fed by the same demonic spirit that John called the Antichrist spirit that is at work in the world today. We need to be aware Christians are being persecuted and Jews from the west coast of Africa all the way across the 1040 window to Southeast Asia. Uh, persecution in China, uh, in Malaysia while I was just there, the government has seized Bibles in eastern Ukraine. My son Ben and I are going going to western Ukraine in two weeks to dedicate a church that my father-in-law built. In eastern Ukraine, Jews are being severely persecuted. More than a half million of them are on the move. Christians are being persecuted, and it's a sign that we need to sit up and pay attention. A third sign is the rapid rise of sexual perversion, and especially of homosexuality. On Monday of this last week, the United States Supreme Court refused to hear appeals levied by five states who had passed laws banning gay marriage and lower level federal courts struck down those laws. Don't have time to address it all in this service. I spoke about it in the other services, but I want to tell you it has tremendous implications. Has, uh, uh, now it has opened the door for the legalization of gay marriage in 30 out of our 50 states. And first and foremost is God's displeasure. But the impact on the fabric of society, the, the impact on our religious freedom, because you see the agenda is not just to win the rights for gay people to marry, it is also to take away the rights of religious people to object. A fourth sign that the Lord gave me was the rise of stupidity. <laughs> In Proverbs 2.7, it says he grants, listen, he grants the treasure of common sense to the honest and to those who walk with integrity. All you need to do is listen good and you'll see it's evident that stupid is rapidly rising. God says woe to those who call good evil and who call evil good. In Romans 1, God says, although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor gave thanks to him. Therefore, their foolish hearts were darkened, and although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and God gave them over to a spirit of stupor. Actually, do you know that studies published this year have shown that IQs have dropped from the 1950s to today. IQs have dropped, and in the last 10 years, they have dropped dramatically as a spirit of stupor comes over us.
The signs of the times tell us, like Daniel, that we need to search the word to see what God has to say about our situation. As I sat in my seat in the atmosphere of the Spirit on Tuesday evening, the Lord just immediately brought four things to my mind that he says in his word about these last days. The first thing is that the word says that these will be demonically ferocious times. That's the word Paul uses in 2 Timothy 3. In the last days, terrible times will come. That word terrible was used to describe the ferocity of the, of the gathering demoniac that Jesus delivered. But there's another thing the word says. Although they be ferocious, the word says that these are also going to be unprecedented times of Holy Spirit activity in the world. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. Next week, I'm going to share with you an experience that happened while I was teaching in Indonesia. Uh, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that I have never experienced before. And I've been in Pentecost a long time, y'all, but it was powerful. Third, the word says that during these times there is going to be a great global harvest of souls. The gospel will be, will be preached to the uttermost parts of the earth and then the end will come. And fourth, and this is what I want you to hear today, the word says that God is going to turn again to the Jewish people and they are going to embrace Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, as their Savior. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And he said, you will not see me again. When Jesus comes again, where is he coming? Where is he going to arrive? Is he coming to New York? Is he coming to Chicago? Is he coming to Los Angeles? When Jesus comes again, he's coming to Jerusalem. And Jesus wept over Jerusalem and he interceded for Jerusalem and he said, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I got to tell you, they didn't teach me that in Bible school. They taught me this gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. And they told me it was my job to go preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. But they didn't tell me that Jesus said, you will not see me again until the Jewish people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For years, I've been aware that God has an end time plan for the salvation of the Jews. But I have to confess to you, I consider that to be God's business and not my business. In fact, that's what I was taught. Whatever God is going to do with the Jewish people, that is all up to God. It's his matter to sort out. It has nothing to do with me. I'm just an American mutt from Philly. I eat soft pretzels with yellow mustard on them and cheese steaks. That's all I know. But I have to tell you, through my friend Grant Barry, I've come to realize that that's not how God has ever worked in the world. God has always worked through the human instruments of his people. And furthermore, God has specifically said that he is going to use his church to reach his people Israel. Paul wrote in Romans 11, salvation has come to us, to the Gentiles, to make Israel envious. Paul said, I apply myself to making my ministry dynamic in the hope that I might somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. As these signs of the times continue to appear, it is time for us to search the word and to discover what God has to say about our role as his church in reaching his people Israel. It's time to add Romans 11 to what we know about Joel 2 and Habakkuk 2 and Matthew 24 and 2 Timothy 3. It's time for us to open our hearts to what the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us and what he wants to do through us. As I was sitting in the service on Wednesday evening with our friends Rabbi Barry and Tony Feynman, the Holy Spirit just said one thing to me on Wednesday evening. He said, Glenn, you cannot love God and remain indifferent about Israel. Three quick directives from the prayer life of Daniel. Search the word. Second, let the word of God ignite your prayer life. Daniel searched the word and what he heard lit up his prayer life. In the first year of Darius' reign, when I saw this shift in power on the world stage, when I saw Babylon defeated and I saw Persia rise, I searched the word of God and I found in the Bible that the desolation of Jerusalem would end after 70 years. So 
I turned to the Lord and I pleaded with him in prayer. Listen, this is a, this is a vitally important lesson from Daniel. When Daniel realized that he was on the cusp of fulfilled prophecy, Daniel didn't just sit back and coast. Daniel dug in and he prayed even harder. Daniel didn't take the attitude, well, God, you said after 70 years, Babylon would be overthrown. So I'm just thankful that you've put me in this position as the top advisor to the emperor. So I can just, I have a nice, beautiful vantage point to just sit back and watch it all unfold. No, that wasn't Daniel's attitude. He said, it's almost here. That means I have to ratchet up my prayer life. I've been praying facing Jerusalem three times a day for 60 years. There was a reason he did that. There was a specific instruction in the Old Testament to do that if God's people were taken captive. He said, I I've been doing that for three times a day for 60 years, but now I see we're on the cusp of breakthrough, so I need to ratchet it up and I need to pray even more. Can I tell you, we need to do the same thing. Uh, when you're on the brink of breakthrough, that is never the time to coast. It is always the time to dig in deeper. We're about to begin excavating the foundation of phase two. The construction fence is going up around the property this week. You'll see it when you come next weekend. The hole is about to begin. And as we dig in, this is not the time to coast. This is the time to dig in even deeper. Power is shifting on the world stage. The signs of the times are all around us. This is not the time for us to coast. This is the time to dig in deeper and let the word of God ignite our prayer life. If these times really are demonically ferocious, then we better get ourselves dressed in the armor of God through prayer. If these are times of unprecedented Holy Spirit activity and harvest, then we need to pray into our participation in that. I don't know about you, but if God is going to send a revival to the suburbs of New York City, I want to be in on the ground floor. I want to be in on the IPO, on the initial public outpouring. If God wants to make our ministry dynamic in the spirit so that Jewish people who live here are provoked to jealousy and reach out for Yeshua, then I want to pray into that. If Jesus isn't coming again until the Jewish people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then we need to pray like Isaiah, God, here am I, send me to speak for you. Three quick directives from the prayer life of Daniel. Search the word. Let the word ignite your prayer life. And finally this. Begin your intercession with identificational repentance. I'm going to explain that term to you. Begin your intercession with identificational repentance. Based on what Daniel heard in the word, he prayed one of the most powerful prayers of confession in the Bible. He pulls out all the stops. Pastor Nick, you can help me. He says, God, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have been wicked. We have rebelled. We have turned away. We've not listened. We've refused to obey. We've been...